So our topic tonight is the resurrection. Surely there is almost nothing in Christianity more fantastic than the claim that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. It strains the credulity of the most credulous to the uttermost. Because death, without doubt, is our most formidable foe. Death fills many people with dread and even with terror and despair. I think of uh, a doctor in London, actually a consultant radiologist, who said to me as I met him in the street one day, I have seen death many times that I have never faced death myself. It's an honest statement. I think it's probably true of many medical people and of many of us who may not be medical as well. I suppose the person who exemplifies more than anybody else in our generation the terror of death is Woody Allen now in disgrace for other reasons. Woody Allen quipped in one of his films, I'm not afraid to die, I just don't want to be there when it happens. And there are lots of people like that. Yet Christians make the momentous assertion that Jesus Christ has risen from death and triumphed over death that in consequence the power of death has been broken. To be sure, it remains an enemy. It is called an enemy. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. The New Testament recognizes it is still an enemy, but it is an enemy which has been defeated. And so the Apostle Paul can liken it to a scorpion whose sting has been drawn or to a military conqueror whose power has been overthrown. The apostle is able to cry defiantly, O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? So for all those who are truly in Christ Jesus, for whom Christ is Saviour and Lord, death no longer holds us in bondage. I hope that is true of all of us. I hope it will be by the end of this evening, if it isn't already. Now, so central was the resurrection to the apostolic gospel that Luke, in the Acts, describes Peter and John, soon after Pentecost, as proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. The Athenian philosophers who listened to Paul in Athens understood this emphasis also, for they summarized Paul's preaching as Jesus and the resurrection. It may be that they totally misunderstood both words. They may have understood Jesus, Jesus, as the name of another deity, and Anastasis, resurrection, as his female consort. They were used to the idea of gods and goddesses, so they seem possibly to have misunderstood Paul to have been talking about Jesus and his consort Anastasis. Anyway, he was certainly talking about Jesus and resurrection. And when Paul summed up the gospel in the passage read to us just now, he said that he affirmed, first of all, as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and that he was seen. Marvelous statement, fourfold statement, to which we will come back uh, a little later tonight. Now, we who have gathered here this evening, who are modern men and women who live in a world of uh, science, naturally have many questions about the resurrection. There is a great deal of skepticism, even, I'm afraid, among the leadership in the church as to whether the resurrection of Jesus really took place 
as it is said to have taken place in the New Testament. And moreover, there is much confusion about the nature of the resurrection and what we're talking about. So, there are three questions that stand out in our minds if we're thoughtful men and women and confront the claim of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Question one, what is the resurrection? A question of definition. Two, did it really happen? A question of history. Three, does it matter whether it happened or not? A question of significance. And those are the three questions that I want to try and address, God helping me tonight, that we may seek to penetrate more deeply into their meaning. One, what is the resurrection? A question of definition. One of the best ways to understand what the resurrection was and is is to consider what it was not. And there are two particular misunderstandings or misconceptions that we need to think about. A. The resurrection was not the resuscitation of a corpse. Resuscitation is the restoration or a restoration to this life. Resurrection, on the other hand, is being raised to an altogether new and different life. The so-called raising of Lazarus and of the son of the widow of Nain and of the daughter of Jairus Three raisings from the dead performed by Jesus during his public ministry were all resuscitations. These three people were brought back to this life. It is this that aroused C.S. Lewis's sympathy for them in that he said they had to do their dying all over again. Because they were brought back to this life only to die again. But the resurrection did not bring Jesus back to this life. What would have been the point of that? It would only have been a temporary postponement of the inevitable. Instead, Jesus can say, as is recorded in the New Testament, I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore never to die again. And I have the keys of death and of Hades, the keys being symbol of authority and power over death and Hades, the abode of the dead. So then Bultmann, I suppose his name is well known to all of us as a prominent uh, German theologian who died a decade or so ago, so Bultmann, we must declare, was wrong when he referred to the resurrection of Jesus as the, res the reviving of a corpse. It is actually extraordinary that Bultmann should have imagined that the traditional and orthodox teaching of the resurrection had anything to do with the reviving of a corpse. As we shall see later, it doesn't mean that. We also know that David Jenkins, Bishop of Durham in the north of England, seems to have made a somewhat similar mistake. He dismisses those of us who believe in the resurrection as believing that God performed a conjuring trick with bones. We don't think that at all. That's not the Christian understanding of the resurrection. Of course, the resurrection did involve the body of Jesus, but it did not mean the miraculous reconstruction of his body out of the particles of which it was composed during his life, so that he was brought back to this life. Resurrection is not the resuscitation of a corpse. Then B, resurrection is not merely the survival of an influence. That is to say, 
To declare that we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ does not mean that we simply believe that his influence lives on in the world. Che Guevara, whose name I'm sure is familiar to all of us, who is a cult hero of uh, many Latin American students, uh, a few decades ago, one of the great freedom fighters or rural guerrillas in the Latin American uh, freedom movement, after he was assassinated in the jungle, students started chanting in their classrooms in Cuba and elsewhere, Che lives! Well, when Archbishop Makarios of Cyprus uh, died, his followers paint-sprayed the buildings of Cyprus. Makarios lives! And I know students in some British universities who are a bit fed up with the church, who chalk their slogan on church buildings, the church is dead, but Jesus lives! Is that all we mean by the resurrection? Che lives, Makarios lives, Jesus lives. Why, some one of our favorite choruses says that. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way, etc. Is that what is meant by the resurrection? It isn't. We're not just declaring that his influence lives on or even that he lives on. There is no reference there to the resurrection of his body. So this is rather loose talk, and it plays into the hands of those who deny the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Bishop David Jenkins of Durham has spoken of the resurrection as an explosion of the personality and the power and the presence of Jesus. Because that's not what the New Testament is talking about when it refers to the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Paul regarded the resurrection as being an objective historical event involving the body of Jesus Christ. So let me go on from the two negatives. The resurrection is not the resuscitation of a corpse, it's not purely the survival of an influence. It is an objective historical event. It is, in fact, the beginning of the new creation of God. So let me go into this a little bit with you. You notice when I read it to you and when Mike Pantney read it just now that we're told four things about Jesus. He died for our sins. He was buried. On the third day he was raised and he was seen. Now of those four, two are the most important. Namely, he died and he was raised. The burial attests the reality of his death because normally speaking you only bury dead people. While the appearances attest the reality of the resurrection. So he died and he was buried to prove it. He was raised and he was seen to prove it. So the resurrection was a historical event. And it is, I think, in God's good providence that whenever we say the Apostles' Creed, as we did just now, we affirm not only that he suffered under Pontius Pilate, but that he was raised on the third day. The reference to Pontius Pilate attests the historicity of his death. The reference to the third day tells us that his resurrection was a datable historical event. And both events, the death and the resurrection, can be pinpointed on the calendar. But it was not only a historical and objective event, it was also a physical event involving his body. And as we look again at those four things, he died, was buried, was raised, was seen, I think it becomes obvious 
He died and was buried certainly concerns his body. It's only bodies that die and bodies that are buried. Therefore, if it was the body that died and was buried, it must be the body that was raised and seen. You can't change the subject of the four verbs in the middle. No, he died in his body. He was buried. He was raised. His body was raised. You can't imagine that he was raised while his body remained buried. That's absurd. No, he was raised and he was seen. So then, it is the same body of Jesus that died and was buried, which was raised and seen, but the body was changed. So, the resurrection is a radical new beginning. The resurrection was a dramatic, divine, creative act never performed before in the history of the world, not performed since in the history of the world, although one day all of us will have the same experience. But so far it is unique. Only Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. And it was an event by which God arrested the natural process of decay and decomposition he did not allow his Holy One to see corruption. He rescued Jesus out of the domain of death. He transformed his body into a new vehicle for his spirit and invested it with immortality and new undreamed of powers. So that his resurrection body could pass through closed doors could appear and disappear and reappear, and finally on the day of ascension, defying the law of gravity, could ascend visibly before their eyes. Christianity is built on this stupendous miracle, this new beginning in the creation by God. You surely know the name of the 19th century French philosopher Auguste Comte. He rejected Roman Catholic Christianity in France during his youth and he said he was determined to invent a new religion which would supersede all others and be better than them including Christianity. His Scottish contemporary Thomas Carlyle although he too had rejected organized Christianity and the Church, declared himself unimpressed by the ambition of Auguste Comte. If Comte were to succeed, he said, he would have to fulfill three simple conditions. First, he must live a life of selfless love. Second, he must get himself killed. And thirdly, he must experience a decisive and glorious resurrection. And then, and only then, said Carlyle, the world would be ready to listen to him. But not otherwise. So that is all I think we have time for in answer to our first question, what is the resurrection? Not the resuscitation of a corpse, not the... What was the second one, have you remembered? not the survival of an influence, but rather a radical new beginning. So that the resurrection body of Jesus is the first bit of the material order that has been remade, if you like, redeemed. So the second question, did it happen? A question of history. We live in a very sophisticated modern world, we're very familiar with the marvels of astrophysics and microbiology and computer science. And the question is whether we, in our sophisticated scientific culture, are able to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. My answer is, is yes, we can. Yes, we should. Millions of people do so. 
and the evidence remains very compelling if, mathematically speaking, we still have to say it's not conclusive. If it were, everybody would have to believe in it. So let me rehearse the evidence quite quickly. I'm sure this is familiar to many of you, but I would like to speak quite briefly about it under the three headings, the disappearance of the body, the reappearance of the Lord, and the emergence of the church. A, the disappearance of the body. Now everybody agrees that the tomb, Joseph's tomb, was at some point empty, even if they deny that it was empty on the Easter day itself. But at least at some point it became empty because the story of the empty tomb could never have gained credence if inhabitants of Jerusalem had visited it to see for themselves and found the body of Jesus still lying there. No, at some point it evidently was empty and the body had gone. So the question is, what happened to it? And we want to say that no satisfactory alternative explanation has ever been given but that God raised him from the dead. The alternatives don't hold water. We cannot believe that Jesus only swooned on the cross, then revived in the tomb and came out of it by himself. For one thing, both the centurion and Pilate assured themselves that he was dead before they gave permission for his burial. For another, when he did emerge from the tomb, he gave the impression to his followers that he'd actually conquered death, not that he was weak and sick and in urgent need of hospital treatment. I don't think the swoon theory, though it's been held by a number of people, really holds water. So did the authorities, whether the Roman or the Jewish authorities, take the body of Jesus into safe custody, either in order to prevent the rumor of the resurrection from being spread or to scotch it when it began? And we say, no, that isn't a satisfactory explanation either. Because when the apostles began to preach the resurrection, the authorities could and would have produced the body in order to disprove what the apostles were saying if the authorities were in possession of the body. But the fact that they resorted to violence instead is pretty good proof that they hadn't got the body of Jesus. So if they hadn't got it, was it the disciples who stole the body as part of a deliberate hoax an attempt to deceive people into thinking that he had been raised from the dead when he hadn't. No, that's no good either. Because the apostles were prepared to suffer and die for the gospel of the resurrection. And people are not willing to die for a lie. So no explanation of the empty tomb holds water except that God did raise him from the dead. And the disappearance of the body is thus explained. Secondly, we move from the disappearance of the body to the reappearance of the Lord himself. He appeared, we're told, to individuals like Mary Magdalene, Simon Peter, James, one of the Lord's so-called brothers, he appeared to the two on the road to Emmaus. He appeared to the apostles as a group, both with and without Thomas, and later to more than 500 of his disciples at one time, the majority of whom were still alive when Paul was writing that first letter to the Corinthians. How are we to explain the resurrection appearances? Well, we begin by saying they were not inventions. They could not have been invented for the same reason that the disciples could not be said to have taken the body, because they believed the resurrection. It took some time for them to be persuaded, but they were persuaded. And we cannot believe that they invented what they came to believe. 
there's a fundamental psychological contradiction in that. But if they were not inventions, nor were they hallucinations, tough fishermen like Peter and John do not hallucinate. Moreover, hallucinations, which are the ultimate in wishful thinking, could not have produced the conviction which the apostles later had. The evidence is that the apostles were skeptical to begin with. They didn't believe at first. They needed to be persuaded about the resurrection. There's no evidence of wishful thinking, rather skepticism and incredulity. So the only alternative again is that the appearances were real. Jesus did appear objectively and visibly after the resurrection in his new glorious and powerful body. The disappearance of the body, the reappearance of the Lord, and thirdly, the emergence of the church. In other words, something happened to change the apostles and to send them out on their mission as confident witnesses and evangelists. When Jesus died, of course, they fell deeply bereaved. They were disillusioned about him. And they were very frightened of the authorities. But within a few days, they emerged from hiding, full of joy and assurance and boldness in their testimony. So what happened to make this dramatic exchange? Even Pentecost is not a sufficient explanation. Only the resurrection can do so. So that out of that bunch of disillusioned nobodies, the church has become a worldwide community embracing people of every age and every race and every culture takes a big dose of credulity to believe that the Christian church worldwide is founded upon a lie and that Jesus Christ never rose from the dead. So, speaking at least for myself, this combined evidence, the disappearance of the body, the reappearance of the Lord, the emergence of the church, together constitute a solid and reasonable foundation for believing that the resurrection of Jesus was a fact, an event, a dateable event of history. And I come thirdly to the most important thing of all. We've tried to answer our first question about uh, what it means, question of definition, and the second, did it happen, question of history. Now thirdly, does it matter? whether it happened or not. What is the significance of this event? Granted that it was a historical event, what does it mean for us? Because if it happened, it happened nearly 2,000 years ago, and we naturally ask how an event of such remote antiquity can possibly have any importance for us today. Why on earth do Christians make such a song and dance about the resurrection. To be blunt, isn't it irrelevant? Well, thank you for asking the question. My task now is to persuade you of the up-to-date relevance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that it speaks powerfully our condition to our condition in a way that no other event of such remote antiquity does. There is something about the resurrection that resonates with modern men and women like us today. In fact, the resurrection of Jesus Christ brings us a threefold assurance which we urgently need. A. The resurrection assures us of God's forgiveness. Now, forgiveness is surely the best, 
one of the best, if not the best, of all God's gifts, and desperately needed by all of us. I could dismiss half my patients tomorrow, said the head of a mental institution not long ago, if they could be assured of their forgiveness. All of us have some skeleton or two or three in some dark cupboard, something in the past that we've said, done or thought of which in our better moments we are profoundly ashamed. Our conscience nags us, torments us, condemns us. I tell you frankly, my friends, that nobody is free who is unforgiven. True freedom begins with forgiveness. If I were not sure of the forgiveness of God by His sheer and utter mercy, I couldn't look you in the face and I certainly couldn't look God in the face. I want to run away and hide, as they did in the Garden of Eden, because you know it was at Eden, not at Watergate, that the device called cover-up was first invented. And the Gospel begins with the glorious assurance that there is forgiveness with God. And it is the resurrection that assures us of this. Let me explain. Several times during his public ministry, Jesus forgave the sins of his contemporaries. Your sins are forgiven, he said. Go and sin no more. Now, he wasn't just declaring their sins forgiven, he was forgiving them. And the bystanders raised their eyebrows and said, But who is this? Who can forgive sins but God only? We would say exactly, who can? And in the upper room, Jesus referred to the communion cup as his blood that was going to be shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus deliberately associated his death with our sins and their forgiveness and said that it was through his sin-bearing death on the cross that forgiveness would be available for us. He would die in our place. He would bear our sin as we saw last night. That's what he said. But how can we know that he was right? How can we know that he achieved by his death on the cross what he said he was going to achieve? How can we be sure that we can be forgiven because he was condemned in our place? How can we be certain that God accepted the death of Jesus on the cross as what the Anglican prayer book, 1662 prayer book, calls a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the whole world? How can we be sure that that is the meaning of his death? And the answer to those questions is that without the resurrection we could never be sure. Indeed, without the resurrection, we would have to conclude that his death had been a failure and that he did not secure by his death what he said he was going to secure. And that's why Paul read honestly in the passage read to us just now that if Christ was not raised from the dead, our faith is futile, we're still in our sins, unforgiven, those who have died as Christians have perished, and the apostles were false witnesses. But, he goes on, in fact, Christ was raised from the dead, and by raising him from the dead, God set his seal of approval on his death on the cross. God declared that he had not died in vain. On the contrary, that on the ground of his sin-bearing death there is a full and a free forgiveness for everybody who repents and believes in Jesus. The resurrection validates the cross. That's the first thing. 
The resurrection assures us of God's forgiveness. Secondly, the resurrection assures us of God's power. Boy and girl, we need the power of God in the present as we need the forgiveness of God in the past. How weak and feeble we are. How irresolute how self-centered, how prone to wander and to fall. Is that not so? We ask ourselves, is God really able to change human nature? Can God make selfish people unselfish, cruel people kind, sour people sweet, immoral people self-controlled? Can he? He can. He really can. And although he will not perfect us until we ourselves are raised from the dead on the last day, and until we see Christ and become like him, Yet already in this life he begins the process of transforming us into his own image, a process that we call sanctification. More than that, is God really able to take people who are effectively dead to spiritual realities and make them alive? So that unseen spiritual reality to which they were previously dead, is now real to them? Is God able to take deaf people, people deaf to his word and to his voice, and open their ears, and open the eyes of the spiritually blind to the truth as it is in Jesus, and to his beauty? Is it possible that those who are alienated from the life of God because they're dead in their trespasses and sins, can be made alive in Christ? Yes, all those things are stated in the New Testament. God is able to do these things. He has power to give life to the spiritually dead. How do we know? Only because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is set forth in the New Testament as the supreme historical objective demonstration of the power of God. The creation of the universe in the Old Testament and the resurrection of Jesus are the two events that the Bible sets before us as exemplifying the mighty power of God. So Paul can pray in the middle of the first chapter of his letter to the Ephesians that God would open the eyes of the Ephesian hearts so that they might perceive the incomparable power of God which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand far above all principalities and powers and every name that is named. It's marvelous. And it's set before us as evidence of the mighty power of God. The resurrection of Jesus is the supreme historical evidence of the creative power of God. And that same resurrection power that he once displayed in Christ is available to us today, to raise us from the death of sin to the life of righteousness, to raise us from the death of alienation from God into a life of intimacy with him, and even to know something of the resurrection life of Jesus in our mortal bodies. I think I know what I'm talking about, because I think I have experienced it. And I love those two verses in 2 Corinthians 4, 9 and 10 in which Paul, speaking of his own physical infirmities, likens it to carrying about in his body the dying of Jesus. 
in order that the life of Jesus, the resurrection life of Jesus, may be manifest in our mortal body. There is a certain vigor and vitality and energy that can be given to us by the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. But I also want to talk about conversion, about the process of becoming a Christian. You know, friends, we are always in danger in the church of trivializing the gospel and minimizing what the power of God can do. We sometimes think and talk about becoming a Christian as if it were nothing more than turning over a new leaf, making a gargantuan effort to be a new and a different person, maybe making a few superficial adjustments to an otherwise secular life, and becoming a wee bit more religious. Then scratch the surface, prick the veneer of piety, and it's the same old pagan underneath unchanged by the power of God. No, no, becoming and being a Christian according to the New Testament is something much more radical than giving oneself a thin veneer of piety and morality. Indeed, becoming a Christian is something so radical that no imagery can do it justice but death and resurrection dying to the old life and rising again to a new life to be lived in the power of the resurrection of Christ. That the same God of supernatural power who raised Jesus from physical death and one day will raise us from physical death can meanwhile raise us from spiritual death. And we can know that he will raise us because he raised Christ he can change us because he changed Christ. And we need to keep coming back to the resurrection as this marvelous exemplification of the power of Almighty God. The resurrection of Jesus assures us of the forgiveness of God. It assures us of the power of God. And thirdly, it assures us of the ultimate triumph of God. We're told in Romans 8 that the whole creation at the moment is in bondage to decay and death, but that one day it's going to be liberated into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We're told that the groans of nature, of a material order that is out of gear, that the groans of nature are like the pains of childbirth as a new world is struggling to be born. There is going to be a new heaven and a new earth. It's my subject a bit tomorrow night when we think of the coming of Christ. And our present experience of weakness, handicap, pain, disease, injustice and so on will all one day be over. And on that day we shall be new people, with new bodies, in a new world, indeed a new universe. A universe suffused with the glory of God. Well, I know what you think, some of you, you're saying, isn't that wishful thinking? Aren't you just whistling in the dark to keep your spirits up? Is there any evidence for that fantastic assertion that our bodies are going to be resurrected and that the universe is going to be regenerated? Yes, there is evidence. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is its guarantee. As the Apostle Peter wrote, we've been born again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The resurrection body of Jesus is the beginning of God's new creation. As I said before, it's the first bit of the material order to be redeemed, transfigured, 
and transformed. That's why it's so important to hold on to the fact that it was the body of Jesus that was resurrected and changed. And his resurrection is the pledge and the guarantee that we too are going to be resurrected one day. Die end. I finish. The resurrection of Jesus Christ assures us of the forgiveness, the power, and the ultimate triumph of God. It has a comprehensive message that relates to our past, our present, and our future. We can now look back on our past, however much we may have reason to be ashamed of it, because we're confident in God's forgiveness since Christ died for us and rose again. Again, we can face our present. However fierce our temptations, however heavy our responsibilities, because we're confident in God's power, dramatically exemplified in the resurrection. And thirdly, we can look ahead into the future, however uncertain it may be, and however tempted we may be to be fearful about the unknown, because we're confident in God's ultimate triumph, of which the resurrection is the pledge. To live in this assurance of the power and the triumph of God is to live a new life, a life perhaps to which some of us here have not yet been introduced. But I am not exaggerating. I'm not claiming perfection, I hope that is clear, but I am claiming the possibility of transformation gradually from one degree of glory to another by the resurrection power of Jesus Christ within us. This is what Paul meant when he prayed that he might know Christ and the power of his resurrection.